what was it about Prince of Wales that was It's different? a unique mix here. Some place you go to Alaska, mm. especially if you can reach them by road. It's the famous combat fishing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. You know, that you hear Not about. appealing at all. The thing about Prince of Wales is it has excellent stream fishing, and they're they're the small streams that are more comfortable to fish. You know, some of them big rivers up north, man, you you step wrong and you could drown. <laughs> you wash away. <laughs> Pretty unforgiving, yeah. you know. <laughs> all the different species of salmon run into our streams. The kings are the only ones that don't run into the streams. We fish the salt water for those. You know, that's unique for Alaska. You can do what I just described there, stream fish and, yeah. and the ocean fish yeah. the same day. And then we have the deer and the black bear here, too, for the hunting. You've been on some hunts where the pilot came in early to get you because of weather. And, I mean, just crazy, crazy stories like that where yeah, you, that's didn't, the, you didn't know you were going to get out. You know, that's the, the what that's you have the to That's the adventure of Alaska. That's, yeah, yeah. that's why Ken's doing this. In this episode of the Gritty Angler Podcast, we're coming to you live from Whale Pass on Prince of Wales Island in southeast Alaska. I'm sitting in with Brian Call on the Gritty Bowman Podcast with guest and friend Ken Bruff and Brian's dad, Brent Call. Ken is a quiet, unassuming guy, but if you spend any amount of time with him, you quickly learn that there is more to this man than meets the eye. Ken is an accountant by trade, but an adventurer at heart. He's fished and hunted in some of the most remote parts of Alaska, in places that most of us only dream of going to. A couple years ago, Ken quit his accounting practice and bought a piece of property on the island in Whale Pass. He built a hunting and fishing lodge he calls Prince of Wales Eagle Lodge. We purchased lodging with Ken for two weeks. He caters to both DIY fishing and hunting for those who want to do everything on their own, and is also a licensed guide for fishing. He basically set us up with a place to sleep, a truck to drive around in, and a skiff to cruise the ocean shores in. On this episode, we learn more about Ken the Adventurer and about the great hunting and fishing on Prince of Wales Island. If you're interested in going to POW Island to hunt or fish, give Ken and Eagle Lodge a look. We're good to go. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Bowman Podcast. We're coming at you from beautiful southeast Alaska. Don't let this scenery deceive you. It can be <laughs> it can be a lot uglier than this. But today we are treated by a gorgeous blue sky, some clouds, a little wind. We're right here on the beach and we're at Eagle Lodge, Alaska with owner Prince of Wales Eagle Lodge, Alaska. Uh Prince of Wales Island with owner uh Ken Bruff and I got my dad here, Brent Call, and uh, the gritty angler, Chad Nelson, here. And uh, we're going to do a little show today on Prince of Wales. We're going to get to know Ken a little bit. <laughs> We've been here for about a little over a week. Uh, ben shot a really nice bear. Uh, Chad shot a nice bear, and I shot a nice bear. We came down here for the bear, and, uh, and then we thought we'd do a little halibut fishing, but all we could catch was sculpin. So we clean out the hole. Ken will have to tell you about that, because um, um, and if you want sculpin, there are no mer- there aren't any. Left. There's no limits. Is there? Caught them all. We and there's them. a certain hole where a sculpin can they abound. So <laughs> you guys are king of fishing for sculpin. I never had people catch that many before. You you're quite the fisherman, I must say. <laughs> we like to set records. We That's discussed right. that before. Yeah. Uh, Everybody has caught halibut, but how many guys have caught sculpin like we can catch sculpin? Yeah. Uh, you you took the record on this trip. <laughs> I've, I've guided a lot of people, spent a lot of time on the water, and uh, you guys have the <laughs> the skill of catching sculpins down to a fine science. I decided. <laughs> <laughs> Most of my clients don't have that type of skill. <laughs> it takes a lot of... Yeah. The problem with sculpin, for those that aren't familiar with them, is they are absolutely <laughs> worthless fish. <laughs> So they're all spine and skin and <laughs> head mouth mouth. Yeah, There's mouth. no like meat on no, the suckers. Yeah. yeah, that tail though has a little meat on it. <laughs> but they were good bait for other sculpin. <laughs> <laughs> well, you well, know, some we did of catch us, three cod. <laughs> true. I now, say some we. Of us, I won't say who had a pretty good halibut on that. Uh, that let <laughs> get away from. But we won't Dang. talk too much about that, will we? That's we'll right. Leave that part. That's out a of the painful show. memory. <laughs> Chad managed to catch a halibut on or hook a halibut on the line and then lose it. So, yeah. 
Um, I blame it on the sculpin bait. <laughs> it was too tough, too thick skin. The hook get... couldn't penetrate, and I mm. couldn't set the hook. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, we've been here. Uh, Ken, you know, tell us a little bit about you. Where are you from originally? You know, I grew up in a little place called Smithfield, Utah, just there on the uh, <clears throat> Idaho Utah border, extreme northern Utah. It's where my my ancestors settled there, were settlers, and that's where I hailed from. Uh, I went to Utah State University after graduating from college, though I left the area. It was starting to get too big for me, you know. When you get more than <laughs> 10 people, that starts to get to be a crowd for some of those times, you know. Uh, and I, uh, after college, I went to Montana and then ended up Wyoming and lived in Wyoming, uh, gosh, just under 30 years. And, uh, during that wow. time, I always loved to come to Alaska fishing and hunting, though. I, you know, I have this bad addiction, my wife would put it, that, uh, <laughs> I, uh, work brought me to Alaska in the, uh, early 80s, uh, on some projects I was working on. I'm an old accountant by profession. Don't hold that against me, people. <laughs> I was going to say, what did you study in college? So Yeah, accounting. I was an accounting graduate. Worked for a large international CPA firm is where I started my career. Oh. Which one did you work for? I worked for uh, Pete Mark, they called back in those days. Pete Mark Mitchell. Uncle Pete, we called him. <laughs> but uh, I worked in their Montana, Billings, Montana office, and then in Salt Lake for a while, and then uh, broke off and started my own firm with a couple of individuals in uh, Wyoming where uh, where I really wanted to live. I'm not a city <laughs> guy. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not for me. And uh, during that time period, I worked on some clients in Alaska. And uh, to my uh, great satisfaction, they had all the toys, you know, the boats and the float planes and wheel planes. And uh, we got to partake of Alaska wilderness uh, when we wasn't working. And uh, that got me wow. hooked on Alaska. <laughs> You know, so how many times have you hunted? Uh, you know, what have you not hunted? I should say. <laughs> uh, what have I not? I haven't I haven't hunted muskox yet. I've seen muskox taking their pitch. I haven't mus hunted muskox yet. I've hunted brown bear, black bear, of course, a lot of times. Uh, of course, the Sitka black-tailed deer we have on the island, caribou, the doll sheep, moose, uh, goats. We like to goat hunt south end of Kodiak Island. Uh, it's an over-the-counter kind of a tag. And hmm. So I've been fortunate and blessed enough to hunt quite a bit of parts of Alaska and fish a lot of parts of Alaska. You know, we uh, in those days, uh, I was doing the projects up north of uh, Anchorage area, and we'd hunt and fish a lot, uh, you know, the Kenai Peninsula and uh, that part of what they call South Central Alaska up that way and oh. up Fairbanks direction and stuff. But Jeez. When you say fishing, I got to ask about fishing. Is it uh, ocean deep sea fishing or are you hitting streams for salmon? Uh, we did right? both. We uh, fished some of the big rivers, you know, the, the Clutina and the Golcan over there in that Copper River country over above Valdez. We loved to fish the kings, the early king runs and stuff over in there. We would uh, ocean fish, uh, you know, out of Valdez, Seward, Homer. Those kind of areas, and then we do some uh, stream fishing. Even did a little uh, uh, pike fishing up in a lake, uh, Lake George, up by Fairbanks. That was a some fun times too. Uh, a lot of the rivers that we were fishing were the big rivers, and uh, I had a really good friend uh, uh, named Dr. Alan Carter from Wyoming, and he's a Alaska addict like myself. And, during those years, we always said, if we find the right place in Alaska, we're going to buy some property up here. <laughs> and uh, one day, I uh, had a daughter uh, marrying to a family who's got a lodge here at Point Baker. And uh, I took my first trip to uh, southeast Alaska in 2004. First time I'd fished down that way. And uh, found out Prince of Wales was a very unique place. And uh, that friend of mine, Alan, and I uh, came on that trip together and trip was over uh we said we found that place we're going to buy some property on prince of wales what was it about prince of wales that it's different? a unique mix here you know yeah. there's a there's a lot of fun fantastic places to fish and hunt in alaska you know that a lot of really great places and i feel blessed i've got to visit quite a few of them and experience a lot of them but the thing about prince of wales is it has excellent stream fishing and they're they're the small streams that are more comfortable to fish. You know, some of them big rivers up north, man, you 
you step wrong and you could drown. <laughs> you <wash> away, <laughs> Pretty unforgiving, man. you know. Uh, yeah. But here, you know, we have lots of streams, literally hundreds of streams on the island. Uh, all the different species of salmon run into our streams. The kings are the only ones that don't run into the streams. We fish the salt water for those. But, you know, here on the island, we have all those streams you fish, and we have the salt water at our back door. You know, that's unique for Alaska. You can do what I just described there, stream fish and, yeah. and the ocean fish yeah. the same day. Yeah. <clears throat> We've got and, to do both of those, so. Yeah. So that makes it unique. And then we have the deer and the black bear here, too, for the hunting, yeah, you know, and uh, lots of great black bear. Of course, Prince of Wales is known for its record-type class black bear, and uh, Sitka deer hunting is great here. So that's what drew me, that combination of things that we really hadn't found elsewhere, and, and not lots of people, you know. Some place you go to Alaska, <laughs> mm. especially if you can reach them by road, it's the famous combat fishing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. You know, that you hear not about. appealing at all. <laughs> we really haven't seen, we've had the whole, it feels like we've had the island to ourselves. Yeah. That's the way it is. You know, it gets a little more busy, you know, July, of course, and mm -hmm. uh, early August as far as on the island fishing and stuff, but. You know, again, that's what drew me here. There's not the crowds. There's uh, it's to me like hunting and fishing ought to be. You know, you and your buddy most days is doing your your thing together. We uh, that's because there's nothing up here. We're an hour and a half from the nearest <laughs> grocery store and well, cell we reception. We should talk about where we're at exactly because I remember, I came here the first time I came to Prince of Wales was in 2007, and I came with my uncle. We stayed in Thorn Bay. And we looked on the map, and we could see Whale Pass on the map. And we're like, how do we get to there? And uh, if I remember right, there was no road going here. Or, or if there was, it was a crappy road. It was dirt road right by then? Yeah. yeah. Gravel, quote, but pretty sketchy gravel road. But oh. uh, they just finished a new paved road that comes just close to our head. What's so. that intersection where they st started at? What's that? Uh, where the pavement ends is, we, we call that the, the junction to turn into, uh, go to Neck Lake, Well Pass. It's basically where the pavement ends is approximately three miles from our lodge from here at Well Pass. Yeah. It used to be, I think you had to drive like an hour on a gravel road to get here. You did. The gravel uh, up until uh, a couple of years ago ended down at the uh, Kaufman Cove turn That's what it was, Kaufman Cove. It. That's where we took that. Yeah. Stepping now, up. Uh, they're moving roads into your area, Ken. <laughs> wow, I know. So what, next <laughs> thing you know, there'll be more closer. people. Uh, yeah, they. Start it's been nice having property. the pavement get us that close, but also we are a little worried about you. Know, you people, you know, come visit, but, you know, don't, don't visit too much. <laughs> Once they get a service station, you'll be in trouble. You'll probably want to move. Uh, yeah, there's no yeah, grocery store mostly. up here, uh, no gas stations. Well, I should say Don has a little grocery store. Yeah, Don. Uh, I, I shouldn't shortchange Don. Don's a great guy. You know, he helps me do some guiding and, and, and deck cans for me some days. And Don has a uh, the start of a little grocery store, and he's even going to start selling little gas. So we're arriving into the hey, modern I, world. He here. has some <clears throat> eggs. And yeah, he did. And it's about a you know a ten foot by ten foot little store. A regular yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, scale that's score that's pretty here. nice. I mean, that's. That's different. Um, we've been catching crab every day, right right out here, yeah, just right to the, the left of us in the the bay, right off our our our, our uh, lodge is right here, about twenty yards from us. Got the deck here over oceanfront property, and uh, we're cruising in the little skiff out here, and we've got some crab pots out there. Chad is a crab like oh, junkie, yeah. <laughs> so uh, if he doesn't eat them all. In one go each night, he freezes what's left for taking home. But the crabbing has been great. Um, is that Phenomenal. typical on the island in general? or You know, we're blessed with really good crabbing here in our bay. <clears throat> Parts of the island, uh, there's good crabbing. But unfortunately, uh, just north of us, you know, when you get up, you know, like Port Protection and Point Bank at the very north end of the island, like where my daughter and son-in-law have their operation, uh, the sea otters have moved in and uh, basically destroyed the crabbing. Oh. You know, and it's just a, a classic lesson that we all should understand it. Anything totally uncontrolled like that uh, can have consequences. And the consequences of then have bear up there have been that uh, there, there's basically no crab left. Those mm. uh, otters have eaten themselves out of house and home. And uh, 
you know, they're protected, which is fine and good, but uh, hasn't been too fine for the crab and the species like that that they've over. And these are the Dungeness crab, correct? <laughs> Dungeness crab is what we catch. We have a few tanner, and once in a while you'll run into a small king crab will show up in the pots, but Dungeness is our and primary up crab. up there as well? Yes, yeah, that area is. Baker, Those somewhere. Dungeness, I haven't had a lot of crab, but that Dungeness is delicious. A little Sweet, butter, too. little butter dipped Slid in butter, right and it just, oh, like, great. slips right down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, with the sea otter deal, um, you know, we, we actually came across a lot of them when we were up north. Uh, hunting for bears that's true glass in some of the bays and we we haven't seen many down here um you know they are protected but are they endangered anymore i mean what's their status you know to look to see the wrasse of them up north i would You'd say they're of least <laughs> yeah, concern I, I don't think there's too much concern of going extinct <laughs> any day soon how far north just at the end of the island type of or just further north up between the you two you get up by red bay and there's a whole bunch yeah, yeah as soon as you by. just get a few miles north el capitan into el, el capitan, capitan has a lot of ton of them in el capitan that's where we've yeah. seen the most yeah yeah el there, capitan, uh, there was a ton of them there's That's a true. hefty duty population of just north of us. The uh, you'd think <clears throat> like the orcas or the you know the like something would be eating those little guys. I mean they're well, they're not so little. They're like big as Chad. Yeah, they're not little. <laughs> Some are pretty good size. <laughs> I mean, not as big as man. Me. They are huge, <laughs> muscular creatures. <laughs> <laughs> they're just laying out there in the water with their sunning themselves, eating the crab off their chest. They're eating shellfish. I mean, shellfish. I see them yeah. eating. They're crunching everything. I, Chad and I heard them crunching. I was like, we heard it before we saw, saw them. Yeah. Those teeth are. I mean, they've got. They're snapping open muscles. Yeah. They're fun little critters to watch, and like I say, I I like the sea otters, but uh, I'd like to eat one. <laughs> I don't know about that. They don't look too tasty to eat. They look a little like they might be a little tough and screaming. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. The uh, native Alaskans, uh, they're allowed to hunt them. Uh, the, the rules there are that they can't just shoot them for the sake of shooting them. They they're supposed to do something with the uh, hide or something. The really? hide huh. and stuff. Huh. You know, that use the traditional. Sea otter as their ancestors did, but uh, otters the and the seals they can shoot, right? Correct. Yeah, they uh, they have. Uh, so restrictions do they the hunt seals, them but... much, or is it? Are they kind of? What's the latest? Not really. You know, uh, you don't see the natives, especially around here, hunting them too much. And uh, I wish they would hunt them a little more. You know, and, and yeah. keep the balance there in a little bit better. Check. I honestly haven't seen very many native people. You know, there's up not north? too many uh, right up here on the north end of the island. There, there's a, a heavy population of them down when you get down to Cloak and yeah, Heidelberg. Okay. You know, there's there. are, are a lot of native uh, Alaskan property down there. The, the Klingit Hide It uh, tribe is what is What's here it called? South. Klingit Hide It. That's all one word? Uh, it's hyphenated. a hyphenated word. Uh, it's actually two tribes. Two tribes, that's what it sounds it. like. Clean mm-hmm. it and hide it. Hide it. Mm-hmm. Like hide it in the corner. <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> Is that where they I don't get the think name they'd hide appreciate it? you quite saying it that way. Well, uh, just trying to get really the phonetics down. <laughs> good people, uh, you know. There's a lot of good people. Uh, yeah. Can't hide it, natives we have here on the island and stuff. Uh, some of them have the alcohol problem that uh, you know the yeah. Native American is They've famous for, had, unfortunately, yeah. and they know that and recognize that and. And uh, are dealing with that issue problem. Yeah, we saw signs pretty much all through town in every bathroom that you go into at different stores, you know, where they talk, where there's, where there's, you know, helplines and stuff for that kind of thing. So it's definitely, and it's a, it's, it's, it's clearly spelled out that there's a problem with that and Mm -hmm. it's something that, you know, that there's help for. Yes. So, um, so the crabbing, is solid down here. Um, we hear say that halibut fishing is good too. <laughs> However, <laughs> you know this is the early time of the year. The halibut go out into the really deep, far out waters because uh, we in the winter time. Just so people know, Chad and Anthony and Ben and I and Dad, uh, we came down here for the bear hunting, and Chad and Ben and myself drew a tag. Anthony and and Dad came to be our gophers and just Whatever. chauffeurs and stuff, pack animals, pack animals, <laughs> and, and they've done a good job, <laughs> phenomenal. It. And uh, 
Uh, so, but we came, I've traditionally, I've been here twice before for bear, black bear and I came the last week of May and, and into the first week of June. And I think I shot all my bears, my other two bears after June 1st and, um, finding a bear that's not f- pretty rubbed out by then is tough. They seem to just, you know, go bald by the time you get to June. So we talked about coming here earlier so we could get after the a good hide. You know, get a good hide cuz you know really on bears I we eat the meat but it's it's you know it's nice to get a bear that has a nice coat as well and bring that home too. So we came early and uh we got here May 1st or so, yep, April 30th. April 30th we flew up to So yeah. catch can. So uh, some bears still hibernating then? They are. You know, each year is its own situation. But normally the bears start coming out of hibernation in, in late April. And uh, as you get deeper into May, you know, they more and more they come out. out. What, keep, what keeps them in there and what keeps them not coming out? You know, of course, the weather and how okay. tough the winter has been. This winter uh, it was quite a bit colder than we've had in a few years, uh, a little more snow than we've had the three or four mild winters in a row now here in the area where there hasn't been much snow, milder weather. And uh, it's been great. The Sitka deer population has really boomed and the age class of the deer up because there hasn't been a winter kill. But it's the weather and how hard the winter's been seems to affect them the most. We were in town yesterday getting our bears sealed and talking to some guys, and they were saying they haven't seen very many bears out yet this year. It seems like... Um, the hibernation has gone longer, longer into the year than is typical. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that colder winter that we had, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was cold. You know, our bay here behind me, it, it froze over and, uh, that hasn't happened for a few years. Uh, it's able to freeze because we get so much fresh water yeah. in a small bay pouring in. Take a look at the pylons that got ripped up from the ice. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there was a breakup in April, and some ice pushed out, and then that evening uh, suddenly came in and shoved them big ice back in before they broke up very much, and they damaged our pylons, so we got some repairs to do here this spring. But uh, yeah, I can't believe how much it part tore of the area. up. That's yeah. what those poles but, you know, crazy. Prince of Wales bears, I think, you know, what draws people here, it seems like the genetics, these bears have massive heads. Yeah. They say don't come for the hide, but if you want a big head in a, you know, a big black bear, this is the place to come. Yeah, Prince of Wales as well established itself and well known for the big black bear we have here. It's, it's uh, you know, we, when we talk about size of black bear, we talk about how big they square, you know, whether they're uh, they square, uh, you know, like six foot bear or a seven foot bear, or, and then their skull size, of course, Boone and Crockett. And uh, you know, a good bear to us, they got to be, you know, six to seven foot. Uh, six foot starting to get a good bear. Seven foot's a a nice bear, and the skulls, you know, like twenty one inch skull, like Ben got, is a a really nice bear. But yeah. those kind of bear are common here on the island, not an exception. They're it's common to be able to get a seven foot bear, you know, in these twenty twenty one inch skulls. That's what the island is known for. I thought we were shooting them just because we were amazing hunters. Well, that but. too, you know. <laughs> the less amazing yeah, hunters don't, shoot the smaller. There bear. is that. <laughs> it's amazing choice, though. See, <laughs> no, I uh, the first uh, the first two bears I shot, both of them are right around twenty one inch skulls, and they both are over seven feet. The second one, not quite as long as the other one. But right around those marks is that's a those are big bears. And then uh, this year, my goal both those bears are beautiful that I that I shot. And even though I shot them like June third or something like that, both of those bears have good hides, good coats. They're they're rubbed up here by their front paws, and um, a little bit on on one of the rear. Oh, but rear. they still still make an impressive rug my kids lay on it i mean it's a very functional i'm not you know you guys get these rugs and they hang them on the wall or they drape them on i'm like use that sucker throw it on the floor like lay wow. on it watch tv from there like so my kids use the head and they recline on it and they 
watch TV <laughs> and stuff, and they're always like fighting over the rug. And uh, we got two more coming from um, bear hunt in Alberta that we did, or BC that we did, and then this bear though, I was like, okay, I want a I want a big bear with a big coat. And I don't really care about much else. I really am looking for just a good solid coat. And uh, just so happened that, you know, I definitely saw much better hides. Um, we saw fewer bears than I've ever seen. Yeah, that's true. Um, but I've seen every bear I've seen, almost every one of them has been, looked really good. Like the coat is. So I imagine, I mean, by the time we got here, it was so hot. And there were so many bugs out. Two years ago. A couple yeah, years ago. Two years ago. Yeah, that, it was. Um, these bears were rubbing. I, they're just rubbing. Is that what they do? They just kind of rub? <clears throat> they do. You know, they tend to rub some in the den. That's why, like, those bears you shot, it's classic. They'll have some rub on their, their feet, maybe someplace they're moving their behind there in the den. That uh, So there is sometimes just like, you know, some of the bear you will see a little rub. They'll come out of the out. den already rubbed because <clears throat> yeah. they rubbed while they were in there. But the longer they're out and those things warm up, then you start seeing a lot more rub when you get late into May and June. People ask me, when's the best time to bear hunt in Prince of Wales? Well, you know, any time from the 1st of May to, like say, mid-June, as things shut down, it's good to hunt. But the best hides are going to be early. The boars come out first. So uh, you'll see less bear traditionally, you know, when you come that early part of May. They're going to tend to be the boars. Uh, uh, that's who comes out first. The you know, what's, boars what's odd is I think of all the... Um, bears I've seen on Prince of Wales in 2007 I saw a lot of small bears and I saw a lot of uh, sows but uh, when we came in 2012 that no, was 15. it no no we came up here in 2014 14. 2014 when we came in 14 uh, so it was three years ago I went 12 for, I went blacktail and then 2014 came back for bear. Um, it was all boars and they were big. And now, same thing, like all boars. We didn't see, we don't think we saw a sow. Um, one evening we saw four bears in the same evening in the same two hour window. Yeah. Um, so w some people don't know that it used to be over the counter. Correct. Um, and it sounded like I, I kind of showed up right at the end in 2007. I think 2007 or 8 was like the last year they did an over-the-counter deal. And then they started managing the unit with tags. Um, what have you seen since that's happened? You know, the the item was getting such a reputation all over about its bears and the big bears. that uh, Too many bears were being killed. That's just the, the fact of the matter and the Game and Fish recognized this, <clears throat> so they stepped in and, and put the non-resident hunters, the self-guided non-residents on a draw so they could manage how many bears are killed because uh, if you want to go with a guide, a guided bear hunt, that's still, you can buy those tags, you don't have to draw, and some people don't realize that. But they, then the, the self-guided hunt is by far the most popular because it's, it's a very doable hunt for the self-hunted yeah. type hunter, you know, and so that's what is definitely the most popular here on the island. That's where the bears were getting large numbers harvested by those. And you could tell during those late days of before they put the draw on, the overall size and age class was starting to take a hit. A lot of, you know, it was the right thing to do what they did, to step in and manage things. And uh, it's it's uh, very noticeable, especially the last couple of years, that, that age class and size is getting back to where it should be as they've tapered off not harvesting as many uh, black bears so it was good as the right thing to do but and this is unique for alaska being able to come self-guide for bears and, and is that allowed yeah. here just because there's no brown bears on the island you know uh it's true all over alaska that you can uh, hunt a black bear uh, without a guide uh, and here are as you alluded to on the island we don't have brown bear and that's another thing that attracted me to prince of wales for those of us who've had some dealings with some brown bears they are more aggressive <laughs> there's days that uh you wish they weren't around you know uh that they can be a problem and uh island we have only black bear it's part of the reason why they're so big also and so many right they don't uh, have to compete with the brown bear but it means yeah. we don't have to contend with sometimes the brown <coughs> bear issues our black bears are much so, more easy to get along with so what are these uh brown bear 
encounters you speak of? <laughs> you know, there's been a time or two where it's a little intense whether, you know, <coughs> who is going to get the fish in the game, uh, us or the brown bear, you know. And uh, in those situations, the brown bear always wins out. He has first rights, you know. That's been my philosophy, and I think most people who have been around him decide that's the wiser choice of the things, you know. They're so dominant when they when they are defending a spot or oh. they have something they want. I mean, yeah, when you see them up close and personal, they look as big as a house and <laughs> very intimidating. Dude, you know? a black bear does. Yeah, these seven foot black bears, they stand up. They and look they make your hair on your neck stand up, and they're a lot more calm. So f- when, so typically, the way I've seen black bears on this island is they're fairly docile. They're, um, you know, I see them knocking some trees over here and there and digging through stuff. They're strong and powerful. But I haven't seen them like they see you. They run. They see you. They run. They yeah. get out of there, or they kind of just see the big ones. Kind of see you, and it's like they're blind as a bat. They're like, "Are you really?" I there? think that's <laughs> something, and they turn and kind of mosey away. I haven't seen the big ones just book it. You know, I just. But they know they're king of the castle on this island. Yeah, they're the the top uh, predator here, the top animal here on the island. They know that. But Chad and I, we'll do this on a different podcast, <clears throat> but we. We just came on two bears, the bears we shot. We came on those two bears, and they were fighting. Oh, that was And I've wow. seen now black bears, like, go at it for the first time. It's crazy. It is. Even from I told us, telling Chad, man, if they just wanted to run down the hill and kill you, they could. Oh. <laughs> they could. <laughs> totally. <clears throat> oh, yeah, they I could. mean, they're yeah. just, the fierceness was intense, man. We estimate our bears weighed 350 pounds, roughly. But it's 350 pounds of just sheer power, raw muscle. Oh, yeah. They are. Well, and they just strong. came out of hibernation, so they're skinnier than they yeah. normally would be. Um, You're roly poly. I don't know if that's true. I think he might have been 400 <laughs> pounds. He's a fat bear. Brian's had a lot of fat on it yeah, still. You know, when we skinned that thing, the fat on the back of it was literally this. The back strap is like this thick, and the fat is. It's not a 50-50 ratio. There's more <laughs> fat than meat. He wintered well, didn't he? Oh, like, he did. It looked like bacon. It looked like a pig. And uh, he, um, the hide on him was uh, perfect, too. Like a super healthy, healthy bear. Chad's bear looked like we were skinning it, and just there was no fat left. I and mean, it was super lean. It was a, it looked like an older bear, maybe. Uh, bigger, slightly bigger. But Hence just, all the perforation in my now skinned bear hide. It yeah. got a few skinning <laughs> holes in it. The taxidermist can't sew shut. But no practice. <laughs> it was dark. It was pouring rain. We were just in a hurry. We were, get. as you say, in the rainforest. It was One of those few days it rains around. Yeah, so, yeah. so tell us, tell us about this, uh, this locale's temperature and climate. Yeah. You know it. Uh, it's a uh, a rainforest we live in here. Is it, you know, is it a temperate rainforest? Yes, it's a temperate rainforest. Uh, people always say, oh, you know, how do you ever live in Alaska? It's so cold. And and uh, it was a lot colder in Wyoming than it is here. Yeah. <laughs> when I lived in Wyoming, well, Star Valley, I, Wyoming, it's a lot colder than That's here. interesting. The thing that people don't realize about southeast Alaska and Prince of Wales is you got Alaska way up here in the north. Yeah, it's, yeah. And, and then you got all miles. those islands that trail down the coast of Canada. All the way down to nearly Washington yep. uh, State. And Southeast Alaska is just, Ketchikan is just north of Seattle, not... It's right off the right off the coast of northern British Columbia. So you're yeah. closer to state Washington State than mainland Alaska. Oh, yeah. We're a lot closer to Seattle than we are to Anchorage here. You know, uh, Prince Wells Island is uh, one of the biggest islands. It's... They, I've heard some people say it's third biggest island, fourth biggest island in the U.S. It's about 140 miles long as a crow flies from tip to tip. It's a good-sized island. But it's the last of the chain, as you're talking about, of southeast Alaska. Dixon Entrance is the big water just on the south end of the island, and that's uh, what separates us from the Canadian water. And the Queen Charlotte's, the Graham Island, is just south of us. So we're at the very southern end of Alaska. Hmm. Our weather here... Typical winter day is like uh, low 30s, uh, uh, high 20s for a cold day. Uh, 
the exception was issue. We got down into some high teens and a lot of 20s. That's what caused the the beta freeze over. But, you know, we're not that sub-zero stuff. We don't get that here in southeast yeah. Alaska. Like this week, you guys have been here. The temperatures have been in the low 50s. Uh, now, last year, which was a mild year, the same week, we were in the 70s last year. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Which was too warm for this area. It affected fishing. It affected things. That's way too warm. Yeah. But 70 is a very warm day for us in summer. But uh, because we're so far north, the 70 feels like it's mid 80s down there. Yeah, yeah that's how it was for us two years sunburn. ago. Yeah, we earlier we said we were here in 2014, I think we were here in 2015, and we were hunting in t shirts oh, the end of May. It was hot, and it was 70 degrees every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was hot, but we'll get the, that humid. kind of temperatures, and it's humid because you know, of course, here on the ocean and stuff, but uh. Ocean protects is not really cold stuff. So the weather, though, um, the, how much is your annual rainfall? Uh, we get a bit of rain. <laughs> you know, Ketchikan is the rainiest part in southeast Alaska. You know, they get 80, 90 inches of rain. You know, we're more like the 40 to 50 range kind of stuff is what we get. So it rains a fair amount. Yeah. But it's not like it rains every day. Uh, a typical summer... We'll get two or three of those storms that will blow in, and, I mean, it really lays down the rain. I mean, you can take a five-gallon bucket laid out in the open and in an evening the next morning. That bucket will be chucked I did water. that once. <laughs> yeah. I came here in August hunting blacktails and just a DIY hunt. I just put all my stuff in a backpack. Travis, my brother-in-law, and I, we flew here for pretty cheap, cheap as we could find. And uh, we took the ferry uh, from Ketchikan over to the island to POW, and then we rented a car um, on the island, and then we drove up to some place we found on Google Earth and parked, and then we bushwhacked to the top of an alpine meadow, and then we got there, and then it rained for six days, like <laughs> torrential downpour, and uh, like I, like there was, we were, our tent was like a waterbed, the bottom <laughs> of it just it filled up with about six inches of water. We were filtering water. We just unzipped the tent and scoop water up and filter it right there on the runoff. And, uh, we had crossed these streams that were like a foot. Just actually we, we hiked the stream bed. Cause that was probably one of the easiest ways to get to the top without having to bushwhack. But when we came back down, that stream bed was now like, 10 to 15 feet across and it was like neck <laughs> yeah. deep or waist deep and it was too fast so we had to find some fallen logs to get to the other side and we had to hike miles through the bush to try to find a, a spot That's it felt crazy. like miles probably wasn't it's was probably 400 yards but it might as well be five <laughs> miles because it's yeah. impenetrable but it was a it was a storm of, of storms for me and i grew up in the northwest but it just wouldn't let go it wouldn't stop and uh, and then it broke, and we had two or three great days of hunting, and it was sunny, and it was amazing. But I had never seen that much water come down all at once in my life. And I couldn't believe the tent held the water out. It had, like, this little bathtub. We had Tyvek on the bottom. And people were like, you should have set the tent up where there wasn't water. I'm like, dude, <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't get it. Yeah, That's if you've never it been there, you I've can't set up a few it, tents no. before. This was a good spot. It's yeah. just there was no getting around that it's much hard rainfall. For, it's hard to explain that to anybody who's never had if, if they've hunted west or even east. There's no, there's no concept to what rain is. There's yeah. you can't put it in perspective. I it mean, was like it, Noah's flood. Yeah, but it felt <laughs> like yeah. the tent was. It just rose up and you'd push it down and it would like a waterbed. It yeah. just squished and I, down and pop back up. It's, as the water flowed through, and I'm like, I feel like we're sleeping in a river, like a <laughs> shallow three-inch stream. Now, that's Alaska for you. Know? It's not just like we get the only rain here. Now, yeah. Let's be fair. You know, that's I've, true. I've been on Kodiak and up north on sheep hunts and caribou hunts. It was just like a, it was like a fireman was standing out of the fire hose blasting on your tent, you know. And you thought, uh, will it ever quit raining so I can leave my tent? You're fogged in. You're, it's raining so hard, you... You think, well, I'll be tough and hunting the rain. Well, the problem is, rain's already getting seen up. You can't and see then, anything. What's the uh, point? Yep, right? Even if you got the best that's rain what, gear in the world, you'll stay dry. But you can't. That's see what I thought. Well. I was like, I'll just hunt, <clears throat> even if it's raining. We'll hunt through it. We've done that in Oregon. The animals are still out there. Neighborhood float planes make a little noise. Here we go. 
Yeah, but he's it, gonna... it did not. <clears throat> that was all, you know, in theory, that all was good until it was a sheet of water. <laughs> After three days in the tent, we have some video, but it's X-rated. Uh, we <laughs> X-rated. I went outside. Oh, it was so wet. I just went outside in the full nude and just soaked <laughs> up and just bathed right there in a torrential downpour and then ran back inside the tent. And uh, you didn't need a stream. I mean, you had a full shower, <laughs> gushing shower. Um, <laughs> and uh, but that that was a pretty awesome experience. <clears throat> uh, um, but I wanted to ask you about the the back to the fishing thing. We came the first two weeks because we really of May because we really wanted to get after the bears and find some great coats. We knew though that the fishing wasn't ideal at this time right. of, this time of year, but kind of hoped that we'd we'd still get lucky, you know. So, what are the fishing? What's the fishing options this early, and when does it get better? You know, uh, Mays are always uh, a crapshoot, as the saying goes, on what's going to happen for the halibut and and May and stuff. The only salmon around are kings. There's some kings out there around that we can catch during May. But the, none of the other salmon are in the region and area, and that's true throughout all of southeast Alaska. Um, so the only salmon are going around the kings and the uh, the halibut. They start moving in during May. But uh, last year, you know, like I spoke of, uh, the first week of May, you would have thought it was mid-June the way the weather was. And we had really good halibut fishing uh, last year. Throughout early May and and uh, it's probably because of the warmer weather you talk about yeah that warmer weather and the water warmed up sooner so they and stuff. came in quicker than normal yeah uh-huh. our water temperature was up because of the warm weather uh, this year that water is really cold out yeah, there it's still yeah, we're cold. talking I think uh, boat winners out the other day it said the water was like forty three degrees you know it's cold <laughs> yeah versus uh, last summer the water got up to like fifty four fifty five oh uh, so just more feed in the water because it's warmer. Uh, all the conditions, you know, yeah. affect them. But uh, so May can be of some years that uh, how it can be good out there. But like this year, uh, you know, and I, I checked with some of the other guys uh, around, and everybody's kind of seeing the same thing. How uh-huh. fishing is really tough right now. Uh, in what the whole area. What about the streams? You got some steelhead in in some of the creeks right now, don't you? We do. Our steelhead come into the streams in uh, late a- late March, April, and early May. Uh, we don't get the huge steelhead runs up here on the island, uh, but we have lots of streams to get steelhead. And again, it's not the combat fishing, but that's our steelhead time mm-hmm. here on the island. And uh, of course, there's a cutthroats uh, around in the streams and the dollies in the streams and lakes. But <clears throat> some people, uh, their fly fishing skills needs a little uh, yeah, we won't go there. <laughs> practice, I understand. They tried for some cutthroats, I hear. To certain individuals whose names I won't mention to save them from you know humiliation, but uh, I don't know. You guys say there was fish in that lake, <laughs> but we didn't see any. So. You know this. We did get skunked on that. <laughs> Those fish get lake. ignored because everybody's chasing the salmon. But you know, I got to be honest. You guys are the first ones I've ever sent over the lake. I haven't come home with some cutthroats to show for. But you know, I know. Jack. Maybe it's the cold weather that time of year. Oh, it looks too. There know. was some excuse other than us. <laughs> For sure. We couldn't compete with the Eagles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Chad said uh, last night, he's going to bed, he's like, I want to go back to that lake. It gave us the middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> it gave us the big middle finger. and I, It just hasn't sat well with me. <laughs> In seriousness, the cold water, of course, makes us fish less active and yeah. it's affecting that too, but... Uh, uh, yeah, we, we were we talking say to more a, about we the were, skills of fishing. We were locking to, talking to a local guy over there, and he goes, he looked at Chad, and he's like, uh, "You're going to need a bigger net." <laughs> <laughs> and he had a big net. And, and uh, he, I said, "Why is there big fish in here?" He's like, "Oh yeah, there's big fish in here." But uh, yeah, we didn't catch one. So hey, I caught two fish though. Chad did not catch any. Well, those were minnows. Yeah, <laughs> look. They were about as, <clears throat> six inches. More like my arm length, maybe. Uh, <laughs> in half. Yeah. Well, it must have been the fishing conditions, because I've seen how excellent you guys can catch sculpins. <laughs> yeah, so, see, so I, we're in good shape. i got to acknowledge that. It must be oh, the fish, man. not your fishing skills. Uh, you you took the 
the award of the most scopins I've ever seen anybody catch in one day. That's for sure. Well, what was weird is on that lake is we didn't even get any chasers. I mean, didn't even move a fish. So Yeah, that's unusual. I don't yeah. know what was going on, but we're going to go back and redeem ourselves. Try a little yeah. bit more spinners or something? No. We're just going to try it again on the fly rods. When it comes to fishing, one of the things that well pass is probably – most famous for is we have a summer run of cohos, the silver salmon. Uh, when you say summer run, uh, what we're talking about is those cohos, they start showing up right out here in our bay, right in front of our place. Middle of June, start getting in good numbers here in late June and run throughout July and into early August, which is, that's not the normal coho time as anybody's fished for cohos in Alaska knows. Cohos is traditionally August, late August, September. Oh, yeah. We have a run there that comes into the island. Into our bay, I should say. Lots of runs in the, in the island of Cohos, but we have a late run that comes in a traditional time, but we have the summer run. It's a man made run. There's lots of man made runs, of course, in Alaska nowadays. They call them terminal runs, and that's what that one is. But uh, <clears throat> those fish, the saying is they think they're reds. They come early and they act kind of more like a red uh, sockeye salmon. But uh, that's again one of the things that attracted me to the well past and Prince of Wells is. You know, being able to fish silvers when it wasn't downpouring on you like in September it can sometimes. Yeah, September can get ugly. So yeah, Well Pass is really well known for its summer run of those silvers that come into the bay. And you can sight fish them. You don't have to go out and troll for them. We're sight fishing them with fly rods and spinners right here in the bay and the stream they're running up. That's a lot of fun. Well, what's amazing about this island and when, in regards to fishing is there's just so much water. <laughs> so many lakes, so many streams and rivers. You can you can get out there and fish and not see another person all day long. You can. And, again, that's what attracts people to Prince Wells. Prince Wells has a very loyal following for people who want that niche we're talking about, who want a lot of options, yeah. a lot of streams. You know, they're not just worried about, oh, the run is off in this one stream. Well, go a couple miles up the road, and there's another stream to fish, another run to hit. You know, it's, it's it has a loyal following. Like I said, <clears throat> a lot of great places to fish in Alaska. Uh, Prince Wells is one of uh, the many greats, but it has a very uniqueness to us, as we've been talking about, that, that create a loyal following of some people just really love to come here. Yeah. So, Ken, we had dinner with you the other night, amazing seafood buffet of oysters, <laughs> crab legs, cod that we'd caught. But while we're eating dinner, you told us <laughs> some crazy hunting stories, uh, some adventures you've been on, and I just wanted to ask you, what's your most memorable or craziest hunting trip that you've personally been on? Oh, gosh, they're all unique, and <clears throat> you know how that is. Every trip has its own uniqueness. Even if you don't get the, what you are after, just the being out there with good friends or family and other guys in the wilderness is, is great experiences. But I'd have to say probably uh, on Alaska trips, uh, probably the one I cherished the most when I took my first sheep, my first tall sheep up north. You know, it was... Uh, the hardest, one of the hardest hunts I've ever done, most physically challenging and mentally and everything else, and some horrible weather again like you have on some of your Alaska hunts. But uh, taking that first sheep uh, was very satisfying. It's one of those things, you know, you grow up as a kid, you know, I was that area reading the old, <laughs> watching the Eastman, you know, old videos at the, yeah, the yeah. granddad <clears throat> The O'Connor stories of sheep hunting in Alaska, and uh, that was one thing I always, you know, one day I'm going to sheep hunt Alaska, and, and uh, find the time come, I said, I'm not getting any younger, it's time to go on a sheep hunt, <laughs> <You know? laughs> so at uh, I was just over 50, I took my first sheep hunt, I said, it's time to go do this thing before I can't climb up these ugly, nasty mountains, and that uh, that hunt really stands out, the whole experience, and uh, I got my first sheep, and uh it had its moments where I wasn't sure that was going to happen, you know, and it was a very yeah. strenuous, uh, challenging hunt, but very satisfying. How far north? You said up north. Where did you have to go? Uh, we was at, hunting up in the Wrangell, St. Elias region, uh, hmm. up that at that direction up in Alaska. Now, are you a pilot, Ken? Yes, I have a pilot's license. I haven't done a lot of flying in recent years. You know, there's a saying there's no old and bold pilots in Alaska. That's very true. You know, yeah. Flying up here is not for the faint of heart. You know? no. And uh, you either need to fly a really lot or you shouldn't fly. So mainly the flying I do now is I make sure there's another pilot in with me, that he's the pilot in command, and I'm just kind of helping him, you know, keeping the, the hand on it and stuff. But uh, <clears throat> So you were telling us, you know, probably one of the most 
dangerous parts of hunting in Alaska is the float plane or, or the plane in general. Yeah, it is. You know, there's Alaska's not to be taken lightly. I, I always use the saying, Alaska's waiting to kill you if you get careless, and it truly is. You know, it's very unforgiving. These big rivers up here, you can get in trouble in a hurry if you're out there on the jet boating and it's stuff. It's like he said, the water rises really fast. you got to be ready for it. You know, the ocean is very unforgiving. <clears throat> you know, we're on the inside passageway, which is another thing drew me here, so we get a lot less of those rough waters here on the east side of Prince of Wales and the outside water, but that ocean mm. water is ready to turn on you in a minute, and uh, the planes are, you know, a dangerous element. You're flying in iffy conditions lots of times, and there's been a few hair-raising rides I've had in float planes and a couple of Super Cubs that, you know, you don't forget those moments when they're over with. You're remembering the rest of your life on what was going through your mind and what you're thinking, you know, this could be the day when my hunting <laughs> career might end, you know. Uh, there's those moments in life that you don't forget when those occur to you. Yeah, you were talking about some pilots that, that you know, that uh, didn't make it out. It happens. There's one here locally. Uh, Wrangell is just here to uh, the west of us. And uh, unfortunately, last spring, a pilot there had been flying for years. I owned one of the flight services over there. Uh, went down with some other people with him. And uh, hmm. it was weather-related, you know. Took one too many chances, I guess is how I'd put it. And... Uh, got caught in a situation that uh, no way out. Huh? there wasn't a way out. Uh, the route he was trying to take was blocked by weather, and he tried taking an alternate, and and uh, it didn't work out too good. So basically, you know, if, you, if you're if you flying along, and, and uh, for example, we were ta- talking about this the other day, <clears throat> a guy has wheels, let's say, and he's flying over a lot of water. There's no place to put down. No. Unless you find that open country. And if there's no open country and you need to go down, it's a crash. Yeah, theirs was classic. You know, float planes, of course, went southeast Alaska, what we always use because, you know. There's so much water. So much water and so water much, access. So many where, places to land if you have to. And the place we're coming to fish and hunt, you can access by the float plane and stuff. So the, the wheel tire, the tundra tire of the super cups and thing is more north. tool for up north and stuff. But their situation was classic. Uh, they weren't far from the water there, trying to get over top of Admiralty to get into Angoon. Uh, but their way was blocked, and the the uh, pass they tried getting through was one of those that when you enter it, you better be able to get through because there's not room to get turned. And uh, he couldn't make it through. Tried making that turn, and the plane stalled and down the come. And uh, it's just the risk. If you, you make it, you take. make it. If you don't make it. <laughs> You're, you don't make it. Yeah. and you know, <laughs> I don't like all my chips in one basket. <laughs> I like <laughs> options. <laughs> Majority of time those planes make it, but when one don't make it, we all hear about it. And, yeah. uh, yeah. and it's you, the reminder of the wake-up call. Well, that's the thing is uh, one of those passes you could probably do, you know, 99 times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it only takes one time. Yeah, that and, one time. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, You've been yeah. on some hunts where the pilot, came in early to get you because of weather and i mean just crazy crazy stories like that where yeah you that's the, you didn't know you were going to get out you know that's the what that's you have the to adventure of alaska that's, yeah, that's yeah. why <laughs> ken's doing this that's what you have to understand when you're hunting in alaska you don't put yourself on a schedule <laughs> like you're back home the, the weather dictates when you come and go and you, you go. know yeah. You may come up here for a, a trip, and you may get delayed a day or two before they can get you out in the plane because uh, they don't want to have one of those unfortunate accidents occur. And you may be out there a little longer than you planned on. Yeah. Or, or the plane may uh, come and get you a little early and, and give you your alternative. That happened one time us on a caribou hunt. Uh, we were scheduled to go out, but a day or two early, the plane showed up and said, Guys, it's either now or we're You're not, not sure it's it. going to. You definitely won't be here according to weather reports and they had planned. And uh, that, that's what you have to understand about, you know, hunting these kind of places and stuff. Yes, you yeah. might. Yeah. Or yeah. they might forget about you for, say, a month. <laughs> oh, oh, dude. Yeah, no, dude, I forgot that about that. That story. That is You got to tell us that story. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that's, that's Dave scary. Embry is a fellow who was with me on my <clears throat> that first sheep hunt I talked about in Alaska. And Dave's a great guy, and he's done a lot of hunting uh, all over the world. And uh, way back when he was young, he uh, went on his first bear hunt he was in the military up here uh, in alaska and he and a friend uh 
decided they want to go on a bear hunt using their military rights to hunt. And they went on Kodiak late in the season. Well, it didn't quite work out for them. Not only did they not get a bear, but when the pilot was supposed to come back and get them, uh, it was a bad weather day and he couldn't make it in. And his next day he was uh, off. He was on a 30-day on-off rotation. And uh, he forgot to tell his relief pilot that he hadn't brought those people back in. Back in those days, this has been a long time ago, the schedule was a calendar on the wall. Being the end of the month, the calendar got ripped off and thrown away, and everybody just kind of lost track. There was that just seems so ghetto. <laughs> <Yeah>. Like just <laughs> something's wrong. You, in the system. Ha, that's so, it, but so typical to me of like Alaska. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's kinda, they're a little better nowadays. <laughs> but uh, thank goodness for it, sat phones. So the guy leaves for thirty days. He's off shift. And he doesn't yeah. tell the guy that these guys need to be picked up. He was gone, and the flight service didn't believe it was them. You know, the news he, got out there's two guys missing, but they didn't. Ah, oh, we we've we haven't left anybody out there. It's not us, you know. And didn't well, the wives call out there? Oh, Thirty yeah, days the wives later, called and reported them missing. Yeah, the wife. Uh, one of the gentlemen, not Dave, wasn't married, but the other fellow was married, and his wife reported them missing. Military considered them AWOL. They were military, they were right? Missing <laughs> in non-action, <laughs> and uh, they were looking for them. But just didn't know what to make of it. Didn't know, uh, you know, if they had just what gone AWOL or what had happened. You know, what did, what did Dave do? You know, they uh, they'd remembered flying over a cabin on their way in, and so uh, it took them a couple of days. But they made their way finally back to where that cabin was to get some shit. When they realized nobody was coming for them, you know. And they broke into that cabin. Unfortunately, and this it wasn't was much miles food. away. It took them a few days to get to the cabin, right? Yeah, it was yeah. quite a struggle to get there. And uh, they made it to there and broke into the lease. Now they had shelter, get them out of the weather and stuff, but uh, no food. And so Dave is. They've told the story. Uh, they're just waiting around to die. You know, thirty starving days to is death. a long time. Huh? They're starting to get delirious and just kind of losing it and just laying around, no energy left. They. They tried finding stuff in the day. said, people ask us, well, why didn't you just go shoot something or find something? He says, trust me, we tried. Yeah. You know, we could find nothing late in the season. We couldn't find anything to yeah, shoot. Yeah, critters are. No fishing gear. They're, and, sh- they're getting cover, too. They're, yeah. See, it's late in the season. It's November. It's like it might as well be a desert that has no animals in it. You yeah, know, like, same idea. <clears throat> but they uh, they were just waiting to die, you know, Uh and they would have died if they hadn't found that cabin, got some shelter from the weather and stuff. Yeah, and that, that kept them been. at least out of the weather. But the uh, pilot came back, and uh, when he got back, all the talk was His going around about off. these guys. And, and he uh, you went and got my two guys, and then they realized, whoops, uh, we know where they are. Uh, so they sent out planes looking for them, but now they'd moved, and uh, so they started a search routine. And uh, fortunately, they flew over them, and... Uh, they were just coherent enough. They stumbled out, heard the plane, and waved them down and got rescued. But it it was nip and tuck. Dave thought it was the end of things. Uh, huh. you know. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, dude. So that's probably one of the most extreme cases of a pilot not coming and getting back. The stories I've heard, you know. Nowadays, of course, we have satellite phones and everything. Like when uh, we went and goat hunted the south end of Kodiak, the pilots make sure. And, and Well, he gave us a sat phone, too, when we went out. Yeah, yeah. Goes two times. Yeah, it's so. different time now. It's different time now. There's, and there's no excuse for letting that kind of stuff happen. You know, when you come to these kind of remote places, places nowadays, you got to have the right tools. You stat phones, you know, the safety. spot system, safety equipment, those kind of tools you should have with you. And it's much better now. You know, the pilots and that, we communicate. And uh, you can keep track of, you know, weather so much better, the tools we have now. It's a different day. And, I feel, a lot of tools. I feel a lot better with trioxane tablets. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if those would have even helped us the other night when we're caping out my bear. Oh, my God. He was Just wet. the torrential downpour. It's dark. I mean, if you get stranded out here, Ken, overnight, I mean, what do you do? You know, hypothermia is a killer, of course. Yeah. We all know that. And you have to really watch out for it here. You know, you got to... You got to pay attention to what the weather's do and, and, and be cautious, you know. And, and it's the, you know, the fundamental safety stuff. Make sure somebody knows where you're at yeah. and going to be and where you're supposed to be back. Like, if, you know, 
The other night when you guys didn't start showing up till after 11, you had me starting to get a little concerned. Okay, it's going to be one of them search and rescue deals, you know. Well, at least we I know were, where they're at. We, we you know? were contemplating going back in because we had two bears down at the same time, you know, and so we just got one of them done up, and we were like, okay, we really got to charge back in and get that other one. And We'd planned on it. And it we was so late, up. and it was cold, and we were so wet. And I was like, it's getting dangerous here, you know. Um well, h- packing that meat out, you know, it's... We took a shortcut, Ken. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we took a shortcut. One of those yeah. famous shortcuts yeah. that yeah. we all yeah. regret once we do it. Yeah. We, yeah. Oh, it. we paralleled. We all fell on our butts at least five times oh, coming man. down that mountain. It's so wet and slippery. And th- this this landscape here is waiting to swallow you up. <laughs> it truly you, is. You take yeah. a step and you sink up to your knee. It looked like you, a scene from, like predator in the <laughs> in the jungle back there where we were coming down the hill uh, where he shot true. that bear um, see ben got it off good this trip dude he shot his tin, tin and rolled feet it from down the, the bank boat. and rolled it to the boat <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the objective is to shoot him on the beach this yeah. way time, guys. that's the objective you know well we like to do things the hard way yeah well, make it more venturesome right yeah well it's, what's it's so diy funny, see what's so funny here is we're like a quarter mile through the bush where we where we hear, hear these bears and then the second day we're sitting there cl- oh, yeah. clean we got the packs loaded we're getting ready to go down the hill and i look to my left through the trees and i'm like that's a road <laughs> and it's there's close. a road <laughs> like 80 yards 80 yards there's a road there and that would have made it too easy. Wouldn't have been the oh, true Alaska man. experience. Yeah. I'm like times we went up and down that dang <laughs> mountain, <laughs> and this is a 45 degree angle with and no uh, no devil's club. Of course. Oh no, oh. yeah, yeah, it's all in my hand. See, <laughs> yeah, dude, there was so much devil club. It was like a forest of it. Uh, this one spot, but packing my bear out. That was part of the reason for the shortcut because the devils was so thick. Yeah, but it was um, that was a. That was. It's funny because there's roads everywhere, but you they're not all on a map. You yeah, know, you're that right. remote, and uh, you got a lot of logging roads here on the island. Yeah, yeah. punch you in, you don't even know they're there. Yeah, it didn't show up on the GPS. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that no, one. I, yeah, you don't want to rely too heavily on <laughs> no, your GPS, yeah, do you? <laughs> um. So tell me about the Sitka blacktail because I've hunted them in August when they're in the high alpine meadows in, in still in velvet. Um. But can you can you hunt them in that? Can, do they go hard horned and stay up in the alpine, or when do they come down? You know, uh, we see the deer throughout the year, of course. You know, uh, pretty soon here in uh, late May, early June, they'll be dropping the fawns. That's always fun. Them little teeny fawns. Yeah, little sit- we saw a bunch school. of that. All the road. Yeah, you see them all over when you're going up and down the roads. So uh, they'll start getting their horns on. You know, you'll start seeing the them in the velvet uh, June, July. And uh, August, uh, by mid-August, that's when the <clears throat> the uh, Sitka deer hunting opens on the federal lands and stuff, that which most of the island is, is, is August 15th. And by then, they're just coming out of the, the velvet stage. Some of them, they still got velvet, but yeah, they're getting into the hard horn area. But we'll see them scattered throughout really? the summer. But predominantly, as you alluded to, that during the summer, they stay up high, you know, the bucks do. Uh, they're up high on the top of these mountains above the timber line, and uh, that's the best place to hunt them early. You know, we do hunt them and kill them on the end of bays and and down low, but uh, the best, most consistent place is going to be up above Alpine early on. And when do they shed their velvet? <clears throat> like I say, you start seeing right there at August 15th that they're starting to shed. Uh, you know, a fellow from Wyoming hunted, uh, he killed one, I think it was like in the 17th last year. And uh, the velt was off. It was hard horn. The velt was off that buck. And it was a nice buck he killed. Yeah. We've had these mild winters the last few years. And even the last winter was really cold. So there wasn't a lot of snow. There wasn't a, a big yeah. uh, winter kill. So there's a lot more deer and uh, better age class. Yeah, you were saying right now, like this year, is a great year to hunt. Yeah, these are great years to hunt uh, Prince of Wales right now because of the mild winters and the carryover. Definitely. It's mm-hmm. noticeable that there's more bucks in a better age class than, than normal. Because typically it's not overhunting or anything, predation. It's 
these deer can be wiped out 40, 50, 60 percent of the population with a hard winter just gone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's mm-hmm. their that's the big thing that uh, dictates the population, really. There's so no you've had like deer here. We see them. <laughs> Everywhere. Well, you can shoot four bucks. That gives you a perspective yeah. of how yeah. many how many deer there is. This is and they'll change that allotment based on uh, you know the, the winter kills and stuff. Correct. And That'll be affected by that. Right now is a great time to come up here and blacktail hunt. So if people can and they can, you can just do that one over the counter. There's no draw. That's correct. You don't have to draw. And the most people either come uh, right then early, you know, hunt them into August, very early September. Kind of the no man land is from. You know, after about the first week of September until the rut starts, them deer realize that something's up. <laughs> They're being hunted, and they tend to go nocturnal and get kind of scarce. That's not really when you want to try hunting them that zone there. But then they're like any other rutting deer. When they hit late October and early November, they're rutting, and that's a great time. Those are the two times you want to come early or wait for the I rut. really want to do a sick of blacktail rut hunt. You know, it's the last hunt. week of October, first oh, week of September. It's or a November. Halloween hunt. Yeah. That's just a great time a just wet come the day hunt. after Halloween yeah, or whatever. <laughs> it tends to be a little wet again, but it's I assume hunt. it's gonna it'll dump rain on you the whole time. Most yeah. of the waiters, you probably be waiters. You know, actually it's not quite as rainy there and as you'd think. Uh, yeah. uh rain isn't so much the issue. It start get cold enough then we'll get uh, oh. some snow skis, but really the weather isn't <laughs> normally if there's such thing as normal anymore in weather isn't really too bad usually during then and mm. so you're, you're not fighting the rain too much you might fight a little bit of snow skiff but really it isn't as bad as you'd think that time of year the weather really hmm. and you're you're hunting them on the shorelines or are you hunting them on uh logging roads or yeah if there's not a lot of snow you're hunting them uh you use logging roads to access clear cuts in the muskeg openings and you're you know rattling rattling like you would white tails oh, in stuff. other areas grunting and rattling hmm. and they're pretty susceptible to that very susceptible to that and uh, that's they're fine. very active yeah that's that's where you go man there's your bow tying yeah they're active running around and they're very susceptible to rattling just and running i if they're running like black tails they're just or other, I mean, any deer when they're in that rut, they just lose their minds. They're just yeah. cruising everywhere. You're real dumb. Yeah, I, that's what we need. We're not <laughs> that good hunters. We just <clears throat> we understand how guys work. Yeah, yeah they they're typical guys. Yeah. What can we say? Yeah. You know, uh, if we get a lot of snow, you talked mm-hmm. about hunting them on the shoreline. If we get very much snow, then they all suck down to the shoreline to find something to eat, and that's when. Oh. If that's you get the, quite a bit of snow... Uh, they can push them right to the shoreline. Yeah, that's what I was telling shoreline. Chad mm-hmm. yesterday. Well, you know, this So this week, this was my first time, and I think Brian's too, first time hunting from a boat and oh. cruising shoreline for bear. And it was amazing to me how much country you can travel, how much shoreline you can see, just how much country here you can access in a day, in a few hours. Yeah, in a boat hunting that way from a boat well the only yeah. head up the only problem with that is when they start getting choppy that one place out there you know by st lawrence or whatever we were up there on that one side of the island it got real choppy out there for a while in that little skiff you know and we had to kind of come back around the other side yeah you know, that's one of the but, reasons so you just kind of watch the wind you do you have to watch wind, but again that's one of the reasons i really uh, again was attracted to prince of wales and and and, and why it's popular for the black because yeah. you have the road system you can hunt if there is wind and bad water uh i love hunting the you know the shorelines with the the skiffs and stuff like you're yeah. talking about it was, but it's great to have that option of of a vehicle to hunt the, the mustang yeah. openings the end of the bays you can access by the roads if weather does kick up and get yeah. bad so you're saying though in the fall during the rut you can see some bucks down here along the shoreline too, and, and hunting oh, yeah. from a boat is a good option. Yeah, especially if we oh, get very that. much snow. Uh, uh, excellent option if we get very much snow. All those deer are going to get pushed to the shorelines, and just and, a little know. bit of snow. I mean, it's just a snowstorm, or does it take a little? No, bit it takes a you know pretty good snowstorm, one. pretty significant snowstorm before they push to the beaches. Yeah, yeah. I noticed uh, hunting from the boat was. I mean, it was pretty awesome. Uh, that was the, by far of all the times I've been here and I've hunted all the different ways to hunt black tail, black bear. Cruising the shoreline with the boat was like, it was just a blast. And you're glassing and glassing, see a bear. And we stalk it. Yep. We blow it. Get back in the boat. <laughs> There's a bear. Stalk it. Blow it. Get back in the boat. Yeah. You know, and a couple. That's a fun hunt. That was the only bad part was we kept blowing it. <laughs> there, was, there was one bear uh, oh. that we got on and then we 
two actually that yeah. we passed passed on two bears and we've been looking at the video ever since we got back oh, and we're bad. thinking we shouldn't have passed. why did we pass <laughs> like it was a nice bear both but of them i've it was really hard to see from that distance how big the bear was so we're gonna have to have you look at it and see tell us what you think but <laughs> <laughs> we might have don't, it's so don't make hard. us feel too bad it's so hard so to i better see. say it's only six foot <laughs> breaking the news it was a seven footer yeah. Is that what you Dude, want me to yeah do? we're looking at it now and we're like <laughs> oh, oh we shouldn't have passed perfect coats on these bears beautiful Full fat on. fat roly-poly suckers <laughs> the, but that was the thing is i couldn't tell how tall it was it's just a big black blob yeah <laughs> that's probably one of the more challenging parts of bear hunting especially uh these black bear if you haven't done a lot is judging <clears throat> how big that bear is you know? yeah. yeah but it had a perfect <clears throat> coat on me. it and what i could see was the ears were on the side of the head big looked like a nice pumpkin head but like brian said it was roly-poly big belly fat butt and it just looked like a blob and not a tall maybe not you know, lengthy, bigger. Not then i'm looking at it later and i'm like it's deceptive because the shoulder hump goes way up and i'm like that looks like a nice boar you know and and it, but at the time it's so hard to tell and we were used to i've, I've never so i haven't hunted from a boat before um we did it once 2007 but oh, uh, just for a, a morning and but we didn't really do it we didn't see a bear this time though we did it we saw bears on multiple days um and but you're seeing them at 500 yards a thousand yards yeah and then yeah. you're driving up on them and you're getting to 300 yards or so and we were glassing them and trying to judge them at 300 yards yeah and i didn't bring a spotter because who needs a spotter on Prince of Wales Island? <laughs> now I'm wishing we had a spotter so I could field judge the animal better because at the end of the day, my 10 power binoculars just weren't enough. And, and I can take a, a 250 yard shot with a rifle, 300 yards fairly easily, but I can't, I can't see really how big the bear was uh, yeah. with my bon binoculars alone. At least I didn't feel comfortable. So we had to get closer and closer without that spotter. But it's not like they give you a lot of time either, unless you're Ben Morris, and then they then they, they camp on the beach camp for fifteen on the beach minutes for you so you can shoot while them. you debate. <clears throat> yeah, and we that's didn't a, experience that. that. That's a comical story because Ben and Anthony they're the same boat as us. Ben's like, I'm not going to shoot it. He's not big enough. I'm not going to shoot it. He's not big enough. It's a 21 inch skull bear. This <laughs> thing's know. a giant. They you almost did it not seven it. foot. They're like, I don't know. Feet. I don't know. Then they get up to it and they're like. He, they see the paw after he shoots it. It's, it's paws hanging over the log, and they're walking up to it. And they got the GoPro going, and Anthony's like, "Whoa, Ben, look at that paw! Yeah. That bear's big. That bear's <laughs> way bigger than we thought it was." And then he comes around and sees the head, <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, Ben, you're gonna be happy. <laughs> we were so wrong about this bear." <laughs> Yeah. It's a good type of wrong to be. Yeah, and Anthony's yeah, like, exactly. it's the first time I've ever shot a bear, walked up to it, and found it was bigger than, you know, yeah. didn't have ground shrinkage. Like, yeah. He's like, it was, it was, it was I, a pleasing, it was, it was very, it went the opposite direction <laughs> for him. So, um, but hunting from the boat, uh, was so much more fun for me than any other hunting because, you know, you're out on the ocean, it's and you're, you're doing it in pretty calm weather. Otherwise you're, you're hunting those roads cause it's, yeah. it, it can yeah. be dangerous cruising it and seeing so much country and you're seeing different other other critters and we saw seals and oh, whales okay. and all kinds of stuff while you're cruising and looking for these bears and then some of the bears we saw were were big bears which got us excited and um it's so funny like when they're not roly-poly you can kind of get a uh, I, it's easier to me to see how big the bear is um but when their belly's touching the ground and it's really kind of hard to tell how I, tall it is oh. and how big it is. And I think that's just genetics, though. Like, Anthony's built like a, you know, <laughs> ox. And and that's just how he's born, right? And Ben's a little midget man. So, <laughs> I mean, and they only can grow to their genetic capabilities. <laughs> They're just like people. Their bear, Bears are different. Um, but I did think it was easier to judge those long and lank, lanky bears. Than it is to just the big fat blobs. Yeah, I agree. So yeah. that's why we were confused on that one. But 
<laughs> it can be challenging. You know, you, they say when you see a giant bear, you'll know it. And I think that's true when we see yeah. those monsters. But it's all that in between and with no reference points. And, you know, I've... I've hunted a lot of black bear and, and seen a lot of them, and there's still some bears I'd look at and look at and go, okay, is he a yep. six and a half, seven? You know, which which is, is he? Is he a six and a half? Is he a seven? You know, what what is he there? We know? saw that bear that, that in a location that shall not be named where you told us you saw this monster black bear. That so we, you estimate to be seven and a half. It's probably yep. about a seven and a half foot bear, but he's one of those deceiving hard bears to figure out when you look at. You him. passed on it because you didn't yeah. think it was big enough, and your son was like, "You moron!" <laughs> yeah, yeah I kind of blew it. that one. You know, I was, I'd said if they want, I want to kill ones more like about a seven and a half foot bear. I've killed a lot of bears, and I, we saw that bear, and I watched him, videoed him, and I, you know, it's kind of well, shoot, not shoot, shoot not shoot. You know, my son's going, "Yeah, shoot him!" And I go, "Nah," because he's my son was with me, and I go, "I'm not sure if he's going to make seven and a half or you know." He was just a tall, lanky bear, but probably yeah. the most thing that threw me on him, he's not got a big head. No. He, he reminds you more like a polar bear or something. Yep. And yes. I kept looking at small head going, well, he's small-headed. I think he's really big, but he's small-headed, and mm -hmm. that probably put me off from shooting as much as anything. But he, hmm. oh, he's a, yeah, I, I showed my son-in-law the video who also seen a lot of bears and well, taken Ken, a lot of bears. Well, Ken, we saw him. that bear. And we did not even hesitate to go after him. <laughs> I yeah. saw that bear, and I was like, "Oh, Chad, that thing's huge!" Yeah, and and uh, but the head was—he looked like a polar bear. Yeah. Um, and we we know exactly how tall he was because he was standing on a bridge, and you could see the rail right next to it, and he was standing next to the rail, and so it was like we had references. Yeah, reference on him. And but he's you, about a hundred yards, so we're looking at him, and we're like, "Major, you know?" Yeah. I was like. And and so you could see he was huge, but he had this, he looked like a polar bear, like a yeah. black polar bear. And I was like, his head's not very big, but that body is like a 6'10 human being. Like he's just. Yeah, yeah he's a big toad. I, I should have shot that bear. That was a mistake. But one of those whoopsies though. But he's out but there. But you used the head around. to like kind of figure him out. And, <clears throat> yeah. and he was deceptive. I think if we just saw him in the woods, he'd be like, he's kind of long and lanky. But, but that's one bear, like you said. We saw him, and right away we knew that's yeah. a shooter. Yeah. No hesitation. He's definitely a shooter. I was just holding out for the shooter of a lifetime, and I, I probably <laughs> messed up and should have took him. But uh, it, yeah. That's the one of the hardest things, though, I think about. if you're. That's why this trip I came with the expectation of the uh, you know really wanting an experience and wanting a, a nice coat. And that that's pretty... It, it, it takes a lot of that, well, is he big enough? Is he not big enough? And I yeah. want a mature boar, mature boar with a solid coat. That's all I really wanted. And there's a lot of bears that fit that description. I mean, yeah, that that's pretty easy easy uh, that's doable to fill. Sure. A 21-inch skull, that's a little harder. Yeah. yeah, that's a big big bear when I get those 21-inch skulls. Yeah. What we found is, like to Brian's point about genetics, like, Brian's bear that we shot two years ago, massive, massive head, but the skull was only 19 and a half inches or so. No, it was almost 21. Yeah, 20 and That big eight. one? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Almost 21. Oh, but your one in 2007 was bigger. Body. Body-wise. And skull. Had a small one. And skull. Yeah. Just. But some of these bears just have so much meat. And muscle mass. I was going to say that the skull is, is not as big as you'd think. The first bear I shot was older, had a busted canine. It was a really old bear, uh, and he scored just over seven feet. You know, he measured seven by seven, and uh, he's actually seven and a half, almost seven and a half. And then the skull was almost twenty-one. And uh, that bear, when I got home, and then the bear I shot in fifteen. We have that skull, and he was just a giant. He had two tags in his ear, yeah. you know, probably a garbage bear in town, but he's a monster muscle-wise. But I put those two skulls down, and when we boiled the head, you know, there was muscle on muscle on muscle on the head just just sticking out. And I took, like, like six roasts off his neck. I mean, it's just – you see the pictures. It's just massive, so massive. massive. And – uh but once you take all the muscle off of it, 
and it's just the skull. The skull seems small, you yeah. know? And uh, anyway, when I put it next to the other bear I shot, which didn't have nearly that kind of size on it at all, uh, it, um, you don't, they don't measure the, you know, if you put a tape around its neck, there was no comparison. The bear I shot last year, even though the heads were about the same size. So it just, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Well, both our bears we shot two days ago. Mm-hmm. My bear's head looked a lot bigger than Brian's, but yeah. yet the skulls are within one sixteenth of, of each, each other. other when they measured yeah. them. Yeah. So, and we, yeah. but when I got home, I set the skulls side by side, and uh, the first bear I shot is like three inches longer skull. I mean, three inches longer. Three yeah. inches longer. And, and about three inches narrower. And the other one is just all width and a short, short muzzle and short length. And so, I mean, that's how different the genetics are. But, yeah, you know, they can vary a lot. From one animal to another, one's got this long head and one's got this fat, wide head. Hmm. Um, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. One thing about Prince of Wales, though, is that they grow bears with big heads. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yep. But I was telling Chad, there's one thing. If you haven't bear hunted, okay, <laughs> so bear hunting is like, to me, one of the funnest things to do because they're just, they're big and they 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 do odd things. They knock trees <laughs> over. They grab their feet and roll down a hill and do like corny stuff. And they're just, yeah. I can just but sit. But they and, can also kill you. Yeah, yeah they you can don't also want to lose track you. of that. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. watching the bears, you could just sit there and watch them do their thing for yeah. for hours. But, and, and that's a lot of fun, just, just watching the bears. And then, you know, finding a big one and then get, it gets you pretty excited. And then getting close range, like bow range, which we were in bow range with both the ones we shot, but we shot them with the rifle. <laughs> Yeah. It's kind of chaotic story. moment. Yeah. yeah. Um but uh you you there's one thing about bears is it's all fun and and awesome every part of it until the bears on the ground. And then it's kind of you can't touch it without feeling like somebody pooped on you. Like <laughs> totally. It's just a mess. We still stink and it's been 2 days. I mean, they are one yeah, they're a on the smelly stinky side. critter, <laughs> yeah. and especially if they're wet. Like oh, yeah. they were just in Both a pouring in rain, and so, too. and then they died in the bottom of mud pits and kisses in the middle of a, a creek. Yeah, and you so see the waterfall on one side, and three feet away is the bear. <laughs> Look how much better story that is. Yeah, yeah. Just shoot oh. one on the beach like <laughs> cheaters like Ben do. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no. beach, no, totally. You know? We did it the man way. Yeah. yeah. But, the whole Alaska experience. <laughs> right. We also did it the sucky way. <laughs> but it gets it gets really cold. Um, I mean, it gets the, the the bears get get they're just filthy, and so you're cleaning them and you're pulling. There's hair everywhere. You're trying to keep the meat clean, and and then trying to get a picture with a bear. We were we were some dude wrote this on our Facebook the other day or Instagram. He's like. It's amazing how a bear can be standing there and just looking. And my buddy Aaron, he just shot a grizzly bear. And you see him standing up and the, and it's like, wow, you know, this bear. And then and then you shoot him and he's like, they're just like a pile of blankets. Like they, <laughs> there's no shape. You can't prop them up, prop no. their head. You can't hold them up like you do a deer or an elk or anything like that. Like it's just a blob and there's no moving it. You're no, like, let's pose bad. it for this shot. You can't do anything. You just take a picture of it just laying in a heap. My bear piled up, you know, in that creek oh, yeah. in head. between a big boulder and a log and trying to get him out of there. Head first. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was head first. And I walk up to Brian. I walk up to it and I said to Brian, I thought he was a lot bigger. <laughs> and I was heartbroken. I was so disappointed. But I didn't know his head and shoulders were wedged down in between behind this log and rock. And it took everything he could do to get it out of anyhow, there. Anyhow, pulled him out finally, and I was pleasantly surprised. But getting him out of there was a freaking chore. Yeah, they're uh, that much dead weight. It's oh, a lot man. of work. It's amazing how it's much dead weight they are. There's nothing to get a hold of. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, we couldn't, we had to, we had to field dress them right there in the creek. It was just, we couldn't move them anywhere. Just too big. Even with three of us there to move it, it was crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Of course, it was late night. You, you'd been on a kind of adventure, some hike. (laughs) We looked up and we said, Oh, we got three hours of daylight. (laughs) Remember that? Yeah. (laughs) And it, it took, uh, Four hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, the memories, the memories you create. Oh, it was a blast in a lot of ways. It was just cool. Amazing experience. It it's been an amazing week. I mean, a lot of news for me, crabbing, fishing sure. from the boat. Uh, All going, new experiences we hadn't done before. Yeah. The deep sea for, yeah. for sculping and <laughs> for sculping. Uh, the crab we bitten. got a few cods. He had some supper we that did. Yeah. Some people fish. are healthy eaters, I decide. You know, when they start oh. running out of food when we're <laughs> not near the grocery store. But that's man. another story there, too. <laughs> Those two. Oh, if it wasn't for the now, crab. Now, we didn't run out of food. They ran out of food. <laughs> yeah. Some of us have stores in exactly. our lives. Then there's these guys who are supposed to bring their own food and stay in my cabin. And uh, I'm not, you know, you'll have to explain to the people how all that happens when they <laughs> You know, you well, city people, there's not a grocery store nearby. How challenging that gets. It's we, challenging when you have crowd. Ben and Anthony here and they eat, <laughs> like, you know, three people's worth of food. That's true. It's a Dude, difficult. They eat, to... like, their thoroughbred racehorses with the, <laughs> I don't know. I never, like, Ben. Oh, man. I don't know where food that down. food goes, but that guy can pound it. <laughs> yeah, his little body can put through the food, man. <laughs> Anyhow, if it wasn't for the crab and the fresh fish we have every day, it's not only saving us a lot of money, but time and trips to the grocery store. Yeah, because that's 70 miles one way. It's kind of tough. Yeah, we don't have the market just around the corner. That's why we have a supply room stuffed full of food, so don't have to deal with that. Actually, you got a van (laughs) stuffed full of food. Yeah, we have to ship our supplies up here every year. We needed a new van to transport guests, so we... Took advantage of that van stuffed it full of supplies and shipped it with go. supplies from Seattle up on the barge. Yep. Doesn't doesn't cost you any more for the space. It's just the same space, right? Yeah, that van's going to cost the same whether it's empty or full. Empty or full. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah. So Ken, you have a couple tags in your pocket or hunts, I should say, lined up for the next couple of years. Yeah, this fall, uh, I'm going to take my son along. We're going to go with a couple of fellows we know who live in Anchorage. We're going to go up way up north, up above uh, Fairbanks type country, way up there. And it's a trophy moose area. And we're going to go up there and we're going to hunt moose and the uh, interior grizzlies this fall. In September, we're going to go up and do that trip and go chase grizzlies and moose. And then uh, next. And for you, uh, is that a draw or is that over the counter for residents? Uh, as a, I'm classified as a rural resident by living here in, in the Well Pass, this great big community of Well Pass. So in that particular area, uh, you can, uh, subsistence hunt it and I could kill any bull, uh, have to cut the horns so it's not this name trophy. But, uh, you can also draw a tag and it's pretty relatively easy tag to draw for a trophy bull and then you don't have to cut the horns. Residents or non-residents, either one. DIY that kind of thing. Yeah, on. DIY kind of a thing. I mean, there's outfitters operating that area. Yeah, we're, I'm sure. we're doing a hunt ourselves, of course. And uh, but we each drew a, a tag and the fellows with us because, like I say, it's easy because it's so re- so. Legit, so you say trophy challenge. moose? How? What size of moose are coming out of that area? Uh, you know, we're talking 60 inches or bigger is what our goal is. You know, oh, your, no. your 50 inches and that are pretty common. We're talking 60 inches or bigger is what our goal is. And, you know, Jeez. logistics are challenging enough that, you know, you don't go there thinking all four guys are going to kill a moose. It's just way too much yeah. problem to get them out. So our goal is kill a couple of moose, kill a couple of bears, the guys who don't take the moose. And so that's what we're looking forward to doing this. This fall is September, and then the year following, the ask me for the next two years. Uh, I've got a a uh, stone sheep hunt lined up to finish my my fourth of my Your slam, grand slam, my slam of the sheep and stuff. Yeah. I'm gonna finally go do it and get that fourth one. So that's what my goal is. What and is your favorite animal to hunt? Oh, just any of them. I really enjoy hunting. <laughs> period. I that's a tough thing to. The sheep and goat hunts I've been on are extremely challenging hunts. Get a lot of satisfaction because it is so extreme and challenging and stuff. But 
you know, I love elk hunting, you know, hunted elk since I was a teenager growing up and uh, really love elk hunting. Uh, last fall, uh, my oldest grandson uh, went down to Wyoming to help him get his first antelope, and that was a great hunt, great experience, just going along with him and seeing him excited taking his first antelope and stuff, but... Hmm. You know, uh, I love elk hunting and moose hunting's a lot of work. I like doing it. But <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of like yeah, uh, taking on a major pack, job. Man. You it, know, it's a big animal. It's a big animal. And up here, you know, in Alaska, you shoot one, you go, "Gosh, that's several days worth of work I just created myself and everybody yeah. with me." <laughs> you know, yeah. that's yeah. why I'm really enjoying mule deer hunting. It's Passable. it's just the right amount of animal <laughs> after true. you kill it. Yeah, you know, uh, elk. It's just a lot of work, you know. It's a lot of work. But or you're going for your moose. Are you able to get horses in there? No, it's strictly. It's uh, There's really very little moose uh, horse hunting, I was going to say, period in Alaska. There's a few areas you can hunt the sheep on the, the horses, a few areas they do that. But uh, no, where we're at is we'll be getting way back in there, having a plane flies back in the where a boat stashed for us, and we'll be hunting, you know, using the boat. Oh, to, up down uh, the, the river kind of a thing, river like kind you did of thing. Hmm. And, uh, so no, it's all manpower <laughs> once awesome. we get them moose down to get them back to camp. It's called Alaska power. <laughs> Everything around here is Alaska done <laughs> <Yeah>. by Manuel. <laughs> yeah. That's right. It's not, uh, we don't road hunt around here yeah, too no often. Kidding. I said, uh, say. Especially no, not where we go. Not for the faint of heart, for sure. No, it isn't. Yeah, it's all law, all work. It's and Ken, much. you won that sheep tag. Right? Yeah, my desert <laughs> sheep tag. Right. You know, uh, I, I used all my luck. Uh, some people say I should have went out and bought a lotto ticket that <laughs> year, but uh, that hunt expo they have down there in Utah. I can't uh, see that. Salt Lake City. Yeah, Western Salt Lake City. One Western Western hunt expo. Yeah, that hunt expo uh, here, what's it been, uh, four or five years ago. Uh, you don't have those ones that only non-residents. You know, yeah, one of the benefits for. of not being a resident of that state of Utah is you can go there and you get a little better odds on those. Yeah. They have like yeah. four tags. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I used up all my good luck and drew their desert sheep tag down there uh, <laughs> the, for the, the non residents I think there was 900 or some odd of us put in that's, that that's year. That's pretty and, good. Uh, one dude. There you go. <laughs> somehow mine uh, rose to the top. But yeah, for desert sheep tag that's a phenomenal no good doubt. odds you know i buy those thousand. tickets every year hoping to win something i'm glad to know that they actually do award <laughs> hunts <laughs> yeah. i've been i've been starting to wonder you know where it's those many, yeah if it's, it's a, a mirage if it's, it's for a, real like i thought it was kind of a nasty joke somebody was playing on me when i drew that tag i had a hard time believing it. i didn't believe it until i had tag in hand and i verified with the Utah Game of Fish. This is a real legitimate tag. Nobody's trying to pull a <laughs> nasty, horrible joke on me. You know? yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's how I got a hold of my desert tag. That's right. That was for your desert sheep, and yeah. and you had success on that hunt. Yep. Got uh, got a, a nice desert ram there in the Dirty Devil unit down there in Utah. Dirty I took Devil. my Rocky in Wyoming. Where's that Dirty Wyoming. Devil unit at? Uh, it's down there close to the Henry Mountain area. Oh, okay. Right there by the Henry Mountains. That sounds, that's more, I can't, don't know yeah. Utah. I'm Southern. I don't know much of the other. Cool. So yeah, Ken, fun experience. on this cabin, we're staying, we're staying down here on this, in this cabin, but you have, how many places do you have? Uh, this cabin you're you staying in here right by the water is what was the original cabin mm-hmm. when, uh, myself and my friend brought this property. I've since bought him out. Uh, but it was the original cabin of property. We remodeled it, and we let people stay in that cabin. Yeah. Some people, like in your case, are staying there. They provide their own meals, do their own self. And we have some people staying who still come up to our our main lodge buildings or just up above uh, here. And uh, those buildings, we take our other guests who want us to worry about the cooking and the mm-hmm. housekeeping and stuff. But uh, we have two buildings. Our main lodge building is where our dining room and kitchen and everything is, and our living quarters are in the bottom of that building. And then we have a guest building that there's uh, five rooms in that. They're set up anywhere to host two to four guests. But well, we've I've done the DIY where I come out here with a backpack and a tent, and then I've done the stay at a at a at a at a house, you know, like this. And uh, you know, you have usually if you rent a place like this for a week or two, um, they'll come with a boat, a, you know, a little skiff, and they'll come with uh, a car. Kind of as part of that package. Is that typical for 
for years. Yeah, that's what we offer. And again, uh, there's a lot of great options for the people and folks who want to come hunt Prince of Wales. And that's, again, beauty of what makes it popular. There's anywhere from the four service cabins, if that's mm-hmm. what's within your budget, you can rent those four service cabins and stay in and rent a vehicle and skiff and, and hunt and fish that way. Or there's cabins like in our case that we rent and can uh, keep I've done an eye it. on you and provide I, the other things. I've you need. done the tent thing, and yeah, uh, a number of times. You know, I got to tell you, with the, as <clears> much <throat> rain as you get here on this island, and it doesn't matter what time of year it is, yeah, it's it's really nice to just suck it up and get a place to stay. It changes the whole feel of the trip. Of course, it depends what you want. Like if you really want to get into a, a tent and you know and have that experience, like we did up on the alpine tops. The weather's a little more predictable then, but still, like, it was mid-August and we got d- drenched, so. Yeah, but you did okay with when we used your Adirondack. Yeah, when we, we used that in 15, Ch- Chad's wall tent and we drove here and we took the, the ferry from Bellingham in Washington. Yeah. And uh, came all the way from from that there on great. the ferry I ride. I believe the weather. And that was a blast uh, and had our own vehicle and uh, the wall tent, but. It didn't rain a single day, so <laughs> so you didn't get a real. We test were here no, like ten we, days. There was no test. <clears> no, we <throat> hauled the wall tent and the big stove and everything up, and it was like record sunny. <laughs> so, I mean, um, but but what I was going to say is, uh, it's it's pretty nice to come and find a place. I if if it's within a, a guy's budget, I'd recommend that. When we did DIY, uh, and we didn't when we came up with the ferry and we drove our own truck. That cost a fair bit. Um, then yeah. we're doing it this way where we just flew here. We hooked up with you. We're staying in the cabin and we've, we've got a boat and we've got a, uh, you know, a vehicle. And then we've, we've done it where we, um, where I've flown up here before, similar to this, um, and backpacked in. I just, I just feel like, um, if it's in your budget, this is a nice way to go just because it's, it's my preferred method. Although I'm not sure, we do like the idea of taking the ferry up in the vehicle just so that you can just bring all your crap with you, yeah, not have limited. to try to get it on planes. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that's true. The tanning is an option. It, interesting enough, you don't see people take that option very often. It's too economical to get these forest cabins or rent cabins and stuff from yep. people and stuff that you don't see the tent people. Even your place, so, yeah. it's economical. Like, how much does it cost to, to, to stay here for a week? Uh, we rent that cabin, uh, uh, basically it's 2000 for a week, and the cabin can sleep up to uh, six people, and that comes with a, you know, a skiff and access to a vehicle when they're doing that and stuff. So you, so split, pretty you split that 2000 six ways. It's pretty economical. Three fifty or whatever, close to. It's pretty dang hard to beat, dude. I mean, it's just hard to beat that price. Yeah. Um. But there's a there's people who don't want to worry about the meals. <clears throat> you know, when you get a little older, it's interesting. Well, you young bucks like yourself, <laughs> you know, uh, well, that's when. Actually, they brought me along to cook. Ken, is that fair. what they brought you for? He's a good cook. I get that a lot, too, now. Dude. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> yeah, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. It was okay. It's kind of like the, when you're young, you know, camping out in the rain and getting yeah, soaking yeah. wet and cold and yeah. almost dying of hypothermia seems fun and exciting. You just get a little older and a little more wisdom, maturity side. You know, maybe uh, a roof mm-hmm. over my head on... <laughs> When I, I like have that the metal roof, it good. works well. And a heater to dry out all my soaked gear. Yeah, every it's night, get, get up to warm gear. It's That's been nice, nice to come back to the cab and be able to dry out, warm up, uh, and have a hot nice. meal ready. And shower. No doubt. And a shower. Hot shower, man. That just Although really we haven't takes... showered that much. <laughs> 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 Can't be bothered with bathing. <laughs> so but people graduate from there to then the next step is not wanting to worry about the food and coming yeah, home at true. 11 o'clock at night yeah. and trying yeah. to cook a meal. And then that's the people who stay with us at a lot. And say, that's you know, one of the challenges up food. here is it? True. it's only dark for like five or six hours and it's deceiving. True. Yeah. So you end up putting yeah. in long days, really long days. And you got to decide well, which end of the game you want to be, night or day, morning, yeah. or night, you know. Yeah. It's long days. So, Ken, how can people get a hold of you if they want to come up here to Eagle Lodge? We have our website. It's eaglelodgealaska.com, and our email is uh, eaglelodgealaska at gmail.com. Uh, 
we have a phone that uh, works most of the time. You know, again, <laughs> we're in Alaska, so <laughs> it's not like uh, down there where you just whip out that cell phone. Isn't that kind of how it works? Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, we've been unconnected. We've had to drive long. like two hours south to get <laughs> cell phone reception. Yeah, we get a little bit here, but it's pretty unpredictable here at Well Pass. Uh, a little bit of phone service, but very limited. So Actually, best way is email us. And if I remember, Spencer, when we were on the corner over there, he got something right there at the out there on the in the ocean. He did yeah. when we went fishing. He got a little bit out there. Yeah, he yeah. got a little bit of service. Quite out often, here. you can't stand in here on our docks. Oh, Anthony had stuff. service yeah, here. He, he called his wife every morning, right but he's here. the only one. He had to hang his feet off. Yeah, every time he moved back here, he lost her. He had AT and T. We have Verizon. Oh. So. Yeah, a little plug for the cell service. at and works a little bit better here in our area than Verizon. Yeah. But. But. Um, and you guys have Instagram account. We at, do. We're on at, Facebook and Instagram. It's uh, at Eagle Lodge Alaska, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Eagle Lodge Alaska. So that's uh, another place to follow. I want to see that have more pictures of stuff on there <laughs> you know <laughs> i'm so busy doing all this is keeping everybody in vehicles and boats and yeah <laughs> taking care that's my son's duty and he he tries to keep up with things but he we're does. not as techy as as you <laughs> experts here at the gritty bowman he does guys. pretty it's, good though you either have a lot of time on your hand or you stay up oh. all night working on that stuff one or the other i don't know he which does. it is uh-huh. <laughs> Your son does a pretty good job on the social media. Yeah, he yeah, he's right a good, in there. good young man. He he tries. He's still finishing up with school, but he, he in between times of that, he takes care of that kind of stuff. But we're happy to help people any way we can. You know, if they want to come up here and stay with us, and one of our different options of the packages we offer, or just if they want just information about the yeah. island or things, we're glad to help any way we can. You know, cool. Uh, as far as chartered trips, you do fishing, you mm-hmm. guided fishing. If guys are hunting, they can stay here, but it's DIY for them, right? Yeah, we don't do any guided hunting. Uh, I'm a have Alaska guiding license for the fishing part, but <clears throat> we don't do guided hunting and stuff. We can, if uh, fellows decide they need a guide for the deer and black bear, and that's the only thing we hunt here on the island mm-hmm. is the Sitka deer and the black bear. Yeah. Uh, we can line them up with a guide if they want that, but most people uh, who are coming to Prince of Wales are doing it. Yeah, they would do it by themselves. They do it by themselves because it's very feasible. They're looking for a place to stay and things like that. Uh, but we do the guiding on the fishing thing. Uh, we do that with people and stuff. Or we also have do do it yourself, of course, fishing. And uh, a lot of our guests do their own thing on the fishing too. Yeah, without our assistance. Well, Chad and I got to go fishing right now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's about that time. It is that time. <laughs> But I uh, want to thank you, Ken, for coming on the podcast yeah. and for uh, hosting us this week. Great visiting with you. Yeah. It's been it's, fun. It's been a, you got a, a awesome place and we've had a, a great time and it was, uh, um, still got a few more days left. Yes. Catch some big fish. We've got to go redeem ourselves. <laughs> It'll happen. Just put in some time. You know, we, we just <laughs> want to know for sure that there are, in fact, fish in that lake that you are talking about. Yeah. Uh, I might have to go over there and teach you things. <laughs> oh, <laughs> These young bucks, you know how it is. Yeah, you know? Can't argue with that point. <laughs> but uh, it's been great having you folks here. You know, that's the good part about uh, when I decide it's time to lay, put up my pencils from uh, <laughs> my accounting profession. Uh, uh, that's the good part about running a lodge now is the people you meet and the guests you get to host and uh, yeah, yeah. It's sportsmen and fishermen uh, that come and the Takes hunters. All kinds. It's a it's a lot of fun meeting people and sharing Alaska with them. You know, I I love Alaska. I love this area and just sharing it with other people is enjoyable. Yeah, Ben and Anthony had a blast, and I told them, you know, you should really shoot for ten days to fourteen days because I've done it seven days and it's just yeah, not enough time and uh yeah and they they agreed then they're like wishing they could change their flights and you know kind of alter that because uh you you really do if you're going to make that trip up here seven days you could get rained on four of those days or i mean you really do need just a little extra time to me that's my recommendation mother nature's tough on you you can do it opinion. they did it he he fished. He he did every. He did the whole Alaskan experience. You know, mm-hmm. um, keeps you on the go though, doesn't it? To do but it, it it's a busy, busy deal. So yeah. anyway, we had to help them out a little bit. Tell them had to, to go. Push. Yeah, that's true. We had to hold their hand. Um, <laughs> we had to, that seven and a half footer. I would have shot him. 
Except Ben had the gun. That's true. We it's did. true. We had it yeah. in the boat. We loaned Ben the rifle that day because it was coming down to the wire. <laughs> he had to go home. <laughs> he wanted to do it with his bow. But, uh, well, see, that's the beauty of it. Now you got a reason to come back and put in for tags and come back and yeah. oh, for hang sure. in there and do it with the boat. I'm addicted to this place. I mean, I talk about it a lot. I, I, I mean, the rain is, uh, I grew up with the rain, and so it's sort of just part of the cost. But when it's not raining, I mean, look at this. It's just yeah. It's when it's incredible. not raining, there's there's no place prettier. It is. It's a pretty it place. Just, yeah. Even amongst the Devil's Club, <laughs> it's pretty. It's, it's yeah. pretty in a in an pretty evil way. Up from those man, they got me. Yeah. Good. All right, Ken. Thanks Thank for you. coming on. Thank Stay you. gritty. Thank Stay you guys. Gritty. Fellow anglers and outdoorsmen, let me share a quote with you. There is a delight in the hardy life of the open. There are no words that can tell the hidden spirit of the wilderness that can reveal its mystery, its melancholy, and its charm. The nation behaves well if it treats the natural resources as assets, which it must turn over to the next generation increased and not impaired in value. Conservation means development as much as it does protection. Those wise words are from Theodore Roosevelt. Please remember that our right to fish depends on habitat. Let's be good stewards of our fisheries and fight to protect and preserve our public lands. Thank you for listening to the Gritty Angler Podcast. We appreciate your support and love hearing your feedback. As always, good luck on all of your fishing adventures and stay gritty.